Realm presents Control Alt Destroy. Episode 7. With increased American presence along the border, though current talks suggest a possible scaling back of. Anna Timofeyeva put down her paintbrush to lower the volume of her phone's news stream and listened carefully. The house was far too quiet. Girls, she called, wiping her fingertips on a paint-stained scrap of towel. What are you doing? Giggling from the other end of the hall. Nothing! Anna rolled her eyes, smiling. Mm-hmm, she called, making her way toward her daughter's bedrooms. I love nothing! More laughter, loud shushing. She found them in Paulina's room, sharing a blanket and piled onto her bed, Lada's laptop in front of them. What kind of nothing do you have there? The girls looked at each other. Anna crawled onto the small bed and nudged them until they scooted over to make room for her. Show me. We wanted to surprise her, Paulina said. Whew. Anna angled the laptop to reduce the glare from the window. Video editing software filled the screen and the face of her wife, Olenka, was frozen mid-expression, footage taken from one of her gaming live streams. Lotta couldn't help giggling. Mama. Anna hit play and the footage resumed. She recognized it instantly. One of Olinka's sillier evenings of gaming geared toward younger viewers, full of jokes and self-deprecating comments. The girls had cut in animations and subtitles to emphasize the humor. It's a present from Mama, Polina said. For when she gets back, all our favorite videos... Anna kissed their heads one after another, then made sure to click save before gently closing the laptop. Hey, Lada said, we're not- I'm sorry, Dorgaya Moya. It's wonderful, but we have five minutes until the brownout. Tomorrow you can work on it again. Come help me paint Mama Olenka. One. Ben, class elemental mage, level five. HP, zero out of zero. Mana, zero out of zero. Status, deceased. XP, 12,152. Next level, 15,000. Ben opened his eyes to a black stone ceiling. Something cold at his back. He was lying down. Disorientation dizzied him. The darkness made him feel as if he were still floating in an endless void. He covered his eyes with a hand to ground himself in the physical, anchoring his attention to his body. His HUD was empty. No in-game clock. Chat was completely missing. He couldn't even access his chat records or personal notes. No map. No inventory. No personal data such as XP or stats. Not even any background music. Wait. Was he dead? actually dead? As in, real world dead? He sat up, looking around at the dark cell into which he appeared to have been transported, looked down at himself, patted his chest. No injuries. But all of his gear and items were gone. In their place, he wore a threadbare, stained pair of pants and a matching shirt, both a drab color that might have been white in some distant past life. No shoes know anything. Not on his person and not in the room. Stone walls, stone floor, wooden door. Pressure churned inside him, roared in his ears. Panic, threatening to surge and take hold. He could actually be dead. That would explain why his head was gone. Had his last moments on earth been in a video game? His body went rigid with the realization that he'd never get the chance to see his son again. No. Maybe he was still alive. He shoved himself up off the cold floor and walked the couple of paces to the door, pressed his ear against it, quieted his breathing. Nothing. No tormented screams of the damned, no angelic choir. Just the sound of his own heartbeat pulsing in his ears. A heartbeat. He pressed his hand against the left side of his chest, clung to the certainty of blood pumping through his body. Why would he have a pulse in the real afterlife? 
unless that's just how it worked. Dread crawled up his throat. He grabbed the handle and tucked it. The door opened. Immediately, a notification popped into view. Quest accepted. Welcome to the afterlife. Everything is fine. You are dead. Do you wish to return to the land of the living? Objective one. Cross the soul-strewn plains until you reach the bridge of eternity. Complete the task that will be evident before you. Objective two. Objective three. Objective four. Relief rocked him like vertigo. He was alive. Or, well, he was dead in Alternus, but still in the game, which meant he had to be safe in the real world, and there was more life to live, and he would see his son again. He laughed out loud and took a moment to collect himself. Thank God. Okay. No time like the present to get the heck out of Alternus's hell. Or heaven? No. Heaven would have let him keep his robe. He accepted the quest, then took stock of what was behind the cell door. Some kind of wall? Or was it the atmosphere of the underworld? Murky but translucent. A pale greenish solid of some kind filled the doorway. Other putrid shades of green and yellow eddied within it. Ben wasn't sure what he'd expected to see, but it wasn't this. He placed his hand on it, then immediately recoiled from the cold, gelatinous substance. What in the world? It was like the room had been encased in a rotten jelly. Surely this couldn't be the substance he'd have to breathe out there. Then again, he wasn't sure he needed to breathe at all. The only way out of the cell was through, and he had to get out to find his team. They needed him. He worried they wouldn't survive Russia's murderous rampage if he didn't get back soon. He swallowed his revulsion and pushed his hand into the wall. An audible suction formed, pulling him in up to the wrist. He wriggled his fingers and immediately regretted it when the cold, gooey sensation sent his stomach churning. A couple of slow, deep breaths settled his gut. Nowhere else to go. Just get through it. He was already dead. The worst thing it could do was disgust him. Right? Ben held his breath and stepped into the viscous wall. Cold enveloped his face, his chest, his entire body, and he was thrust forward with very little effort. Mercifully, he emerged quickly onto the other side. It had been a border, nothing more. Not even a trace of the stuff left on his clothes. He stepped into a dim, cavernous space with no ceiling. Or, if there was one, It was so far away that the black above him swallowed it completely. Was he beneath Alternus? Or in some alternate dimension? Neither, he said to himself. You're in a video game. Ahead lay a barren gray terrain of strewn rock with no variation in the geography. Everything was perfectly flat and desolate. Though something moved over the entire landscape like a heat shimmer. No, not a heat shimmer something slithering over the ground. When he drew his gaze closer, he crouched down and realized the rocks were actually tiny, agonized faces that shifted between varied degrees of anguish and torment. Silent screams stretched their mouths into unnatural shapes. The soul-strewn plains, he guessed. Did Tandy design this? He had a hard time imagining something so ghoulish coming from her. As soon as he stepped onto the rocks, the faces below his feet weren't so silent anymore. Rasping, broken voices called out, their misery a visceral thing in Ben's gut. Whispers trailed behind their cries. The planes ahead of him stretched out further than he could see, and there was no way to avoid stepping on these horrors. Every last inch of the ground was covered in them, No reasonable option but to push forward and find this bridge for the quest if he wanted to get back to the others. Onward, then. The air around him was cool and dry. No vegetation. No living beings. Just an endless sea of agonized screams trapped in the rocks beneath his feet, crunching like brittle bone, wailing miserably. A smell like mold and dust filled his nose. The darkness around him could have contained any imaginable horror. 
It just disappeared into nothingness past a certain point, in every direction. Not even an echo trailed the screams. They just died pitifully, only to be replaced by the next and the next as his bare feet moved him forward. There was nothing to call his attention that wasn't grim or empty, so he emptied himself in kind, becoming a vessel made of pure intent. When he went into this focused mode of being, he could exist anywhere and endure just about any mental disturbance. You had to be able to do that if you wanted to survive deployment mentally intact. Or something approaching intact. Eventually he saw a new kind of movement out of the corner of his eye. Another player in the distance, just at the edge of impenetrable darkness. Once he'd registered them, he looked back in the direction from which he had come and saw many others crossing the sea of dead faces, players lost to the slaughter. It hadn't occurred to him until now, but he was probably only the first PvP-related death in Alternus. They all looked the same in their ratty clothes. Some of them grouped together, seeking comfort in human company, maybe even partying up. This made Ben keep his mind focused on the goal, his solitary goal. He didn't want to leave his team down a man any longer than he had to. They, Etta, Tandy, and Dante, didn't belong down here in the darkness, and he wouldn't put his trust in some random player from another nation when his team's safety was at risk. Upon thinking of his teammates, it dawned on him that any or all of them could be among the other dead players. He spent a moment scrutinizing anyone he could see for a familiar silhouette or gait. All of the other players were too far away to be absolutely certain. But no one seemed even vaguely familiar so far. Good. For hours, he trudged across the featureless landscape, or what he thought were hours. No sun, and no in-game clock in the afterlife meant he had no external markers for the passage of time. Once he determined any nearby players weren't his teammates, he deliberately kept as much space as possible between himself and them. A few times some of them tried wandering nearer to him, even gestured in greeting, but he made a show of turning away to communicate clearly. No, he wasn't going to waste any time being held up by others. Finally, after so much walking that a living man's feet would have been worn down to pulp, there was a change on the horizon. At first it only looked like a break in the rocky plains, Instead of an endless expanse fading into black, a line cut abruptly across the horizon. As he drew closer, he saw it was an edge to the land, a cliff. It stretched on in both directions, and when he inched forward, all he could see beyond it was a yawning maw filled with a thick white fog. A notice popped up. The Bridge of Eternity. The quest objective said that once he'd arrived at the bridge, he was to... Complete the task that will be evident before you. There was no bridge, though. An oversight? A change from the hotfix? Was there something here that would trigger the bridge? Other than the void beyond the cliff, there was nothing different about the landscape. Nothing to indicate what he should do to... Hey! Ben turned around, annoyed with himself when he realized he had unconsciously registered the sounds of another player approaching, but he had tuned them out while trying to determine what he was supposed to do. The woman was a youthful member of the Chinese team, maybe in her mid-twenties, and she had tied her long hair in a braid by tearing off the end of one of her sleeves, leaving her shirt uneven. She smiled as she approached and swiped at the air, probably the notification that she had arrived at the bridge. A light dusting of freckles lent her face a sweetness that was disturbingly out of place in the screaming wasteland. So this is the bridge then? She gave Ben an expectant, open look. He took her in. The only reason he knew she was from the Chinese team was having seen her before. Not only was his HUD barren of anything other than the quest, he couldn't even see the usual nameplates of information about other players' roles or levels. He thought he remembered her being a healer, but he wasn't certain. Without any gear, he had no clues about her horizontal progress in the game either. Nothing. She was just a dead player, like him. That was all they were down here. Dead. Another alert popped up. Accept party invite? 
He ignored it. Alternus has gone wild. It's like Battle Royale out there. What was she talking about? Her eager expression faltered just a little. The Hunger Games? He stared at her, then gave her an, I have no idea what you're talking about shrug. She raised her eyebrows. Lord of the Flies? Oh, right. She seemed satisfied. The grin returned in full force. He speaks. But yeah, it's pretty awful back there. Bodies all over the place, lots of blood. Someone cut me clean in half. Not fun. You think they want us to jump? Movement in the distance along the edge of the cliff caught Ben's attention, and the woman followed his gaze. A pair of two people had caught up and were likely considering their options. For a second, the taller one looked like Etta, but when she turned, he realized she was far more muscular and broad. As he watched them, the unanswered party invite timed out and disappeared. She edged up to the precipice and looked down, then promptly crouched close to the ground. I hate heights, don't you? I always feel like there's a giant magnet pulling me down. Ugh. Please tell me they don't want us to jump. Figuring it out is part of the quest, I'm sure, he said. Yeah. So you're not partied. I'm not either. To be honest, a lot of these people just kind of make me nervous, but I like you. You seem less intimidating. He couldn't help the incredulous look that he felt creep onto his face. Seriously? He should work harder on his scowl. Just then, the two people he had been watching jumped off the cliff together. He heard one of them yelling as they fell, but had no way of knowing if it was the terror of the fall itself or something they saw beneath the fog. Well, she said, I guess they figured we'd jump. Did you look around to see if there's anything else, like a lever or something to trigger a bridge? He sighed. <sighs> Do you see a lever? Not so far. Everything she said was so unbearably earnest. There was no way she was for real. Ignoring his dismissiveness, insisting on talking to him, not parting with one of the other countless options she'd probably encountered along the way, she was up to something. She probably knew he was from USA, just as he knew about her. He'd trust her enough to cooperate with her over his dead body. Another notice. Accept party invite? He immediately declined it, then ran to the edge and leapt. Two. Ben fell, spinning his arms as if stirring the fog around him, falling, falling, never quite hitting terminal velocity. The fog remained thick all the way down, just a cool white cloud enveloping his body, barely disturbed by his passage. For a moment, he imagined he was falling through the upper atmosphere of a Jovian planet, plummeting inexorably toward the dense layers below. Just as the thought started making him queasy, something dark approached from below faster than he could register. And with a painless splash, he was underwater, barreling downward into a cold, dark sea. Objective one complete. Objective two, retrieve a quickening flower from the garden of the gods. Objective three, objective four, Everything within Ben wanted to gasp for air, but he was too far below the surface. He couldn't even tell which direction was up. His body had tumbled wildly through the water and it wasn't slowing. At first he thought he was rising toward the surface by his body's buoyancy, but no. This was more of a current carrying him away like an underwater vacuum. Panic overwhelmed him. The instinct to breathe eclipsed everything else, ultimately. His instincts succumbed to the reality of his situation and his body stopped fighting to breathe. He didn't even have to swallow water. He just stopped believing he needed to inhale. Of course he didn't. He was already dead. Nothing but black water all around him, the sensation of movement and a soul deep chill that should have frozen him solid. Not another soul around. No light penetrating from above. No music, no sea life. No ocean floor, no thermal vents. Part of him wanted to close his eyes and detach, afraid of what would come barreling out of the darkness. 
How deep had he gone? How long had he been riding the current? Minutes? Days? Finally, light. Rising up toward him from below as the current sped him along. A pale dot of light that grew bigger and bigger until he was no longer submerged, but falling again, falling through air, the light around him so bright that at first he couldn't see. His vision adjusted just enough that he saw the ground growing closer by the second, and no amount of understanding that he was already dead was enough to quell the sheer terror that overwhelmed his animal mind. About a foot off the ground, Ben simply stopped and floated in midair. He couldn't tell what kind of ground he was looking at, and just as he reached out to try to touch it, he fell the rest of the way. It hurt far less than it should have. Ben took a moment to hold his head in his hands, propped up on his elbows. The ground beneath his body was warm, the air around him balmy. Daylight still shocked his senses after spending so much time in the dark. He let go of his head and moved to stand up. But when he placed his palms on the ground, revulsion lodged itself in his throat. He was touching skin, human skin, leathery and warm. He stood quickly in an effort to distance himself, but his bare feet had nowhere else to step. It was then that he realized the land slowly rose and fell as if it were breathing and the flesh stretched on and on into the distance, a vast landscape of living skin with God only knew what beneath it. Now that he had registered the breathing, it was all he could feel. Some terrible thing underneath him inhaling and exhaling, alive. There was no way this could have been Tandy's idea, was there? In the distance, Ben saw something in the horizon a shape that wasn't just an endless rind of horror on the land. Or at least he hoped so. The Garden of the Gods. A faint noise came from far above him, which grew into the distinct sound of a human voice caught somewhere between a cry and a yell. He searched the cloudless blue sky. A dark spot in the distance grew larger and larger. Someone else who was falling. Ben moved out of the way. The same woman from the Bridge of Eternity came to a stop about a foot off the ground, hair half fallen from the braid. It was one thing to experience this strange place himself and another thing entirely to watch someone else fall from the sky only to come to a dead stop in midair. She flailed her arms and legs, scrambling for the ground in a mess of crying until the afterlife's physics released her to the flesh below. She sat up and scrambled backward as if to get away from the skin but there was nowhere to go. She just sat there and let out a few horrified breaths, then finally made eye contact with Ben. He felt a little bad for her, so he held out a hand to help her up. That was horrible. She took his hand and hoisted herself up with his help. Nervousness flickered in her movements. I thought I was gonna die again. Why is there skin on the ground? Why is it breathing? Your guess is as good as mine. You good? He was eager to break off and get going. Where are you going? She pointed her chin in the direction of the shapes on the horizon. Is that the Garden of the Gods? You seem all right. Ben brushed his rumpled shirt uselessly with his hands, then headed off, trying to ignore the sensation of his feet making contact with the warm, breathing skin. Accept party invite. No sooner had the alert appeared than the woman caught up with him. He declined the invitation and walked faster, his long legs giving him an advantage. She struggled to keep up, but managed, then worked on detangling her hair with her fingers. You shouldn't go alone. I know I sure don't want to. I'll be fine. I'm Mei Lin, by the way. Annoyance made his temples throb. Ben kept his eyes on the target in the distance. Why was she so insistent on partying with him? There had to be people willing to cooperate with her. Her persistence and overly friendly demeanor just made him more suspicious that she had an ulterior motive. If Edda were here, she'd have a good read on the situation. He really needed to get back to the living. Mei Lin jogged a few paces to catch up again, her bare feet making a sickening slapping sound against the ground flesh. And you? What's your name? 
There had to be some miraculous combination of syllables that would redirect her attention away from him. I work alone. Ooh, <laughs> exotic name. So original. Surly American works alone. She laughed in a way that rounded off the edge of her sarcasm and just walked along, rebraiding her hair with deft fingers, still occasionally speeding up to a brief trot to keep up with him. How'd you die anyway? Koreans got me. Their tank is fast. They're all fast. Have you seen them work together yet? When we get out of here, I want to find out how they managed to react so quickly. I think I'm the only one from China they killed, at least when I died. I'm their healer, so I'm really worried, but I haven't seen any of my teammates down here. Are we even down? I can't help thinking of the afterlife as down. How'd you die? Can you just accept party invite? He stopped, declined the invitation, faced Mei Lin, and ticked off several items on his fingers as he spoke. My name is Ben. I haven't seen any other Chinese. I don't know if we're down, and another mage got me. Okay. See? Mei Lin brightened. That wasn't so hard. Now if I could just get you to party with me. Ben inhaled with the intention of telling her to go away, but just sighed and continued toward his target, picking up his pace. Ah, oh, I think that has to be the Garden of the Gods. I can see trees. She wasn't wrong. What had been vague, dark shapes had turned into trees and other foliage as they drew closer, though it was still farther away than Ben would have liked. Why did everything in this place have to be so far apart? Still, he just trudged on, Mei Lin's voice and footsteps trailing along in the periphery of his awareness. Objective location, Garden of the Gods nearby. The garden had appeared to be dark but lush from far away. Up close, Ben's stomach heaved before he consciously registered what he was looking at. Mei Lin spoke at the same time understanding dawned on him. Why did they make it like this? The Garden of the Gods grew up out of the flesh below their feet. Muscle and sinew twisted in spirals to form the trunks of trees from which palm-like features grew. Unlike real palms, they were made of a combination of skin and hair of all shades and textures. A slight breeze stirred the foliage. Real leaves would have whispered, but these membranes of flesh were silent fronds moving eerily in the wind. Wisps and tufts of hair fluttered lightly. A harsh sun cast aggressive shadows deep into the garden. Small clusters of nailless fingers grew atop tendon stalks near the ground. Gruesome flowers that flexed repeatedly, grasping at some unseen target. Another breeze came and kicked up the faint scent of sweat and fear from the blooms. Ben took a few steps closer, triggering a notification. Quest objective, quickening flower nearby. A glowing yellow highlight appeared in his vision, outlining something deeper in the garden, currently obscured by some of the trees. He took a measured breath to steel himself against his own disgust. You're dead, he reminded himself. Nothing in there can actually hurt you, no matter how horrible it looks. Wait, don't go in there. Maylin took his arm, then reflexively jerked away. Seriously, she said. You can't get through there alone. How would you know? Accept party invite. She stared at him, eyes wide. Please. Ben hesitated. Was she being sincere? For a moment, he felt completely incapable of interpreting the lines of her face. Were they pulled tight by genuine concern? Or a carefully crafted expression intended to manipulate him into cooperating? He would have thought himself paranoid if he hadn't had plenty of interactions with the Chinese military to know an American could never trust them, just as they could never trust an American. Mutually assured avoidance. Unless you can give me a concrete reason not to, I'm going in and getting out of here. Mei Lin shifted back and forth on her feet. It's dangerous. We're dead. Ben didn't give her the chance to respond just launched himself toward the garden with several quick strides. Soon he was brushing aside sinister leaves, their two soft branches bending like boneless limbs. 
That smell of perspiration grew thick inside his nostrils and coated the back of his throat. Fingered flowers reached for him as he passed, grabbing pitifully at his pants. His stomach heaved up into his throat several times, but he managed to stay focused, keep himself settled. Finally, he broke past the thick tree line into a clearing of naked flesh, at the center of which lived a bed of burgundy flowers highlighted in his hud. Ben managed a few steps toward the flowers when a loud, chittering sound came from somewhere to his left. He swung around and for a moment couldn't make sense of what he was looking at. An enormous human head swayed back and forth, carried by ten crab legs protruding from where the neck should have been. The eyes rolled in its sockets and the tongue lolled out of its mouth, as if the head were utterly empty, a mere prop for the clacking limbs. As soon as Ben had turned to look at it, it stopped in its tracks and snapped its claws at him from afar. Another one behind him. He spun around again to face a second. Movement in his periphery. A third. More. Countless others. Each of them topped by an empty, drooling human head with unfocused eyes and thin patches of hair. Each skull's proportions wrong in ways he couldn't quite grasp. Whenever he faced one creature, it stopped in its tracks. But those beyond his field of vision descended upon him the moment they disappeared from view. Cold dread chilled him from the inside as he spun back and forth, preserving futile seconds with each glance. A bright bloom of heat and pain tore open his chest, and everything went dark. Three. Ben opened his eyes. Quest accepted. Welcome to the afterlife. Everything is fine. You are dead. Do you wish to return to the land of the living? Objective 1. Cross the soul-strewn plains until you reach the bridge of eternity. Complete the task that will be evident before you. Objective 2. Retrieve a quickening flower from the garden of the gods. Objective 3. Objective 4. He patted his chest where the crab creatures had ripped through him, but found himself whole. Darkness and stone surrounded him. He was back in the starting cell. Frustration flared inside Ben, then quickly congealed into a thick, heavy anger. He sat up, rested his arms on his knees, made himself breathe through his furious heart's rhythms, focused on deliberately relaxing his jaw, his shoulders, he imagined melting down his self-directed rage and forging it into grim determination. He pictured Etta, Tandy, and Dante in the world of the living, fighting for their lives. He exhaled, stood, walked to the door, gripped the handle, and he threw open the door to do all of it again. When Ben fell, hurtling toward the skin-covered land, he was prepared for what awaited him. He closed his eyes and let the fall happen to him, waiting for the sensation of coming to an abrupt stop. There he hovered over the ground for a few beats once again. This time he prepared his hands and feet to catch him and landed cat-like on all fours. No time to waste. He crossed the barren landscape of breathing flesh at a sustainable jog. Knowing there was nothing between his landing site and the Garden of the Gods worth being vigilant about. Several times he passed one or more other players and, once he determined they weren't recognizable, ignored every single one of them regardless of how urgently they tried to get his attention. A few of them looked around with fearful eyes, probably worried he might be fleeing something. Let them wonder. As he had hoped, he arrived to find Mei Lin sitting a short distance away from the edge of the garden. Another player was doing stretches nearby. Mei Lin seemed to be talking to him while decorating her hair with additional strips of fabric from her clothes. When she spotted Ben, she stood up and tapped the other player, then pointed at Ben. Accept party invite. He sighed and accepted. A party list appeared on his HUD, including himself, Mei Lin, and Tiago who must have been the other fellow. You waited, he said, 
Mei Lin smiled. This is Tiago. He's a thief from Brazil. Tiago rolled his shoulders to finish off his stretches, then nodded at Bin. Hey. Ready? Mei Lin said. She didn't even rub his failure in his face, like most people would have. She just gave him that same eager look, perhaps tinged with a hint of sympathy. Wait. How did you know? Ben asked. About the monsters? Yeah. She shrugged. I lied, sort of. I've died before. I mean, before PvP. So you knew what to expect this whole time? She shrugged again and just looked toward the terrible garden that awaited them. Why pretend? I'm sure you know as well as I do, it's never a good idea to show all your cards at once. I had an advantage. I didn't want to give that up in case I needed it. I don't like having to be like that, but this isn't a game. It's politics. I don't know why you told us at all, Tiago shrugged. I would have kept that shit to myself. Why'd you wait for me? Ben said. I like you. I don't know why. You have a nice face. Besides, after this point, you can't party up anymore. It splits each party off into its own instance, like a dungeon boss in an MMO. Except there aren't any bosses. Not really, anyway. At least, not that I've heard of. I don't see how we could fight. How do I know you're not hiding something else? You don't. I don't know you aren't either. But we all have to get through this, and the only way is to cooperate. For what it's worth, there's nothing else in particular I'm hiding, but I don't expect you to take my word for it. You guys ready? Tiago was busy peering closely at one of the fleshy clusters of leaves, then recoiled when it shivered at him. He postured at the flower as if he'd attack it, then waved it off with a disgusted grimace. Man, how is this nasty shit necessary? Ben just headed into the garden, bracing himself for the rancid smell and the horrible feeling of disembodied flesh brushing against him. Tiago and Mei Lin followed closely behind. At one point, a shivering, dog-sized leaf reached out toward Tiago and brushed him on the leg. He unleashed a torrent of expletives, jerking away and brushing his body as if it were covered in ants, which just made him stomp backward into several bushes that folded around him. He pried himself away and shouted at the bushes, Creepy motherfuckers! When they made it into the clearing, Ben crept forward slowly. Each of us needs to look in a different direction, Malin said. Keep our backs together. Ben felt the warmth of their bodies pressed against his. They moved slowly, in unison. The quickening flowers were close enough now that he could see each bud was, in fact, a small, beating heart. There was little time to take in the details. In seconds, numerous crab creatures closed in around the perimeter of the clearing. That is not right, Tiago groaned. Oh man, why do those exist? What the hell? Focus, Ben said, though he agreed. Occasionally a creature would creep forward, fortunate enough to fall momentarily within a blind spot not revealed by any of their fields of vision. But Ben, Mei Lin, and Tiago rotated slowly as they inched toward the flowers. Any monster that had the chance to take a step forward was soon thwarted. Just a little closer, Mei Lin said. Don't take your eyes off them. Ben reached toward the flowers but kept his gaze planted firmly on their vacant-eyed stalkers. What the hell else would I look at, man? Tiago shuddered against him. Look at them! The heads ain't even right! We'll get the flower in time. Ben kept his voice even and smooth, even though he was almost as disturbed as Tiago. Stay patient. Whoever can grab one without looking away from the crabs, grab it, but no sooner. Will do, Mei Lin said breathlessly. Each step was a small victory. Thanks to their back-to-back -back formation, not a single creature was anywhere near them. They tried to lurch toward them, but couldn't. Every time one of them did something bigger than a twitch, Tiago tensed and cursed, which made Mei Lin laugh, which just pissed him off. Eventually, Ben felt his fingertips brush something warm and pulsing. I've got one, he said. I'm going to crouch down to pick it. 
but I'll keep my eyes on the crab head things. <laughs> A sentence I bet you never imagined saying, Maylin said. Hurry up, Tiago said. Let's go. Ben slowly lowered himself until his fingers could grasp the stock. Focusing on keeping the crabs in view kept him from dwelling too much on the feeling of that warm and sinewy stock between his fingers, or the warmer liquid that trickled over his hand after he plucked it. The second the stem broke, a wave of quiet hisses escaped the creatures. They shifted on their legs, agitated from their failure, and backed away from the clearing, disappearing beneath the dark garden canopy of flesh. Yeah, that's right, Tiago shouted, then mumbled to himself. The fuck out of here, nasty crab things. Objective one, complete. Objective two, complete. Objective three, follow the path to the reaping caves. Borrow a cauldron from the Lord of the Dead. Objective four, Four. With the quickening flower pulsing in his hand, Ben led the way through a newly opened passageway through the trees. After a walk through a tunnel beneath a curtain of brittle hair, they emerged onto another barren, flesh-covered landscape. Here, a sun-bleached spine cut through the skin, vertebrae chaining into the distance for as far as the eye could see. An endless rib cage cradled the spine, curving up into the sky, at least a couple of stories tall. Is that the path? Tiago said. Yep. Malin stepped onto the bone, leading the way. Better than the garden, he said. I'll take it. Each vertebra was wide enough to accommodate all three of them side by side, but Ben preferred to linger a few paces back where he could keep an eye on both his temporary party members and the environment. As they traveled, the timelessness of the place started sinking into Ben's head, giving him a sense of mental vertigo. Day never deepened into night. The landscape never changed. When Mei Lin wound up into another one of her rambling conversations, it was a relief, though he wouldn't have admitted it out loud. Tiago bombarded her with enthusiastic questions, which Ben was grateful for so that he didn't have to come up with any himself. At one point, Ben made an offhand remark about his team having unwittingly initiated PvP. Of course, Mei Lin playfully demanded the entire story. Ben wasn't much of a storyteller, neither in skill nor inclination, but he indulged her. We found out the Russians were after some kind of rare scroll. Figured, well, if they want it, and it's rare, there's probably some advantage to having it. I mean, yeah, she said. To sum up a brain-numbing story of slaughtering the same mob over and over again, we got the rare drop, so we went to the location indicated by the item description. Mob camping is the worst, man, Tiago said. Yes, it is. Ben gave him a serious look. Man. Maylin laughed. We went through a couple of trials. A memory puzzle. A mini-boss fight. My team excelled. They took advantage of their strengths, relied on one another, kept their sharp minds on the task in front of us. I can see why we were put together. The other two listened quietly as they walked. Anyway... The Russians showed up during the second half of the fight. Ooh. Tiago covered his mouth and punched the air. Busted. Not exactly. As much as I hate to admit it, I'm not sure how well we would have fared had they not caught up with us. He could practically feel Malin's pointed, teamwork is necessary stare. Once we'd conquered the enemy, of course we activated the scroll. Ben's jaw tensed. We had no idea what it would do, but the Russians did, and exploited their advantage with no less brutality than I'd have expected. One of ours was injured. I couldn't stop it from happening in time. I should have kept a closer eye on what the other team was doing. I should have noticed them tracking our movements. We barely made it out. 
You make it sound like it was your fault. Ben stopped walking. I'm the one with military background. I'm the one who knows how to read enemy behavior and anticipate an attack. I'm the one with the experience and wherewithal to keep the others safe. Maylin's eyes were wide, and Tiago lifted his eyebrows. You're not a psychic, Maylin said. Nothing supernatural about it. Fact is, I dropped the ball. I couldn't even fire off a defensive spell to keep myself from getting killed. All I could do was throw myself in front of my teammate and hope they made it out afterward. They have to have survived for at least a little while. I didn't see any of them down here. Hopefully they're still alive. You put a lot of pressure on yourself, Maylin said. You sound like, well, one of my teammates. He shrugged and resumed hiking. The others followed suit. It's not unreasonable to know your strengths and to be frustrated with yourself when you fail to utilize them, especially when that's your job, your responsibility. That's why I'm here. Well, Maylin said, at least you know they probably survived. PVP's gotta be over soon. Maybe it already is. A look of dread came over Tiago. What if we've been down here for years and don't even know it? Ben waved him off. That would be a tremendous waste of resources from an outside of Alternus perspective. Activating PvP with no idea it's coming? There's so much hidden in this game. Maylin excitedly shook Ben's arm. Can you imagine all the stuff no one has found yet? I bet we don't even know half of what we could be pursuing. It would seem that way. Tiago, what about you? She hooked her arm with him and did the same thing with Ben's, then laughed. Look, we're off to see the wizard, ha <laughs> ha. Has Brazil found anything wild like that, Tiago? Nah. Tiago gave her a sideways look. Ben suspected that even if the Brazilians had discovered anything, he wasn't going to give it up. He couldn't blame him. We're pretty much dead set on climbing the leaderboard. Tiago shadow boxed and bounced on his feet and laughed. Right? Gotta get that skull guy. Brazil's gonna come out on top of the world. As they spoke, the scenery ahead of them changed. And as they drew close, Ben was relieved to see they'd finally made it. Spine and ribs ended abruptly, the path opening onto a craggy hillside devoid of greenery. Wind occasionally kicked dust up into pale sheets. Distant cicadas chirped their high-pitched buzzing song. That must be it, Tiago said as they stepped onto the last vertebra. As expected, a tall cave cut into the side of the rock face. Ben stopped. Wait. Hmm? Malin turned around. Tiago stopped and leaned against one of the last few ribs. What do we need to know about this lord? Ben said. Oh. Malin tightened the cloth that fastened her braid. I have no idea. Last time they had me steal someone's mushrooms, nothing about any Lord of the Damned. Wait, what? Are you lying again? I mean, I'm not, but would I tell you if I were? She shrugged, but gave a lopsided smile. Fair enough. History told him to be wary of anyone allied with the Chinese, but his instincts now told him he could trust what Mei Lin was saying. As much as he tried to find fault with her motivations, he couldn't honestly say he wouldn't have done the same thing in her position and withheld any previous experience in the afterlife. He'd certainly have been far less generous with his knowledge about anything back in Alternus. He nodded. Well then, let's get our cauldron. When all three of their party had stepped off the spine, an alert popped up. Objective location, reaping caves nearby. They crossed the gravel-strewn lawn and approached the cave. Thankfully, the rocks under their feet in their new landscape did not contain faces and did not scream. Ben never imagined being grateful for such a thing, yet here he was. Tiago idly bent down and picked up one of the small rocks, examining it. Ben took a few more cautious steps forward. The space beyond the entrance of the cave was so black that it looked solid. An absence of light so complete, it should have been a tangible thing. Uh... Maylin said. Do we knock? Tiago looked at his rock again, then tossed it into the cave. The air stilled. The cicadas fell silent. 
A large skull slowly emerged from the darkness within, a bare muzzle with rows of blunt teeth and two horns. It looked like the skull of a bull, but as the Lord of the Dam stepped fully into the light of day, Ben could see he had a humanoid body, clothed in a tattered three-piece suit. Everything he wore was black, down to his gloves and shoes, with the exception of a vest made of intricate gold brocade. It would have looked decadent if not for the ripped seams and frayed edges, and the dust, and the smear of dried blood across his vest. The Lord stood with perfect posture and folded his hands. Why have you come to my humble dwelling? The fluid voice came from somewhere inside the skull, though the jaw didn't move. Ben cleared his throat, but Malin spoke first. We've come to, uh, request. Malin paled as she looked into his eyeless sockets. Can we borrow your cauldron? You may not. Ben stepped forward to peer into the cave. We just need to borrow it for a quest. He took a couple of steps inside to see if he could make out anything in the darkness. We'll give it... The Lord of the Dam folded over onto all fours and charged at Ben, his joints bending in ways a normal human body couldn't, fingers rapidly growing into long talons that ripped through his gloves and punctured the fleshy earth. Coagulated blood bubbled up around the wounds he had made, pooling beneath his hands. Wings ripped through the fabric of his jacket, bursting forth from his back. Broad membranes of sickening gray flesh rotted around the bones beneath. He opened his massive jaw in front of Ben's face, and the sound that came out of him was enough to make his very soul wither. It sounded like the world tearing in half. A deep, resonant bellow rolled over the land, tugging Ben's throat down into his belly. This eldritch roar seemed never-ending. No breaths interrupted him. The sound just rolled endlessly over the landscape, shaking the earth to its knees. The Lord's horrible voice became the land. The sound was the afterlife. It was everything that surrounded them. It pulled Ben's mind down like a gravity well, echoing on and on and on. A sound so impossibly deep and ubiquitous and inescapable that it tore at the edges of his consciousness. Then, silence. Bit by bit, the Lord of the Dam returned to his original form. Wings folded and disappeared into his back. Limbs bent back into normal configurations. Claws retracted, becoming human fingers. Once again, standing with perfect posture, the Lord reached into his pocket and pulled out a second pair of gloves, which he tugged onto his hands. As this was happening, Ben felt the cool rock of the cave entrance at his back, and a light breeze made him keenly aware of the tears that were now drying on his face. He edged his way out of the shadow of the cave and fought the part of him that wanted to slide onto the ground and curl up. This isn't real, he told himself. Pull yourself together. The Lord cleared his throat, such as it was. You may not enter without permission. Tiago had watched all of this with wide eyes and now approached the creature. Yo, uh, Mr. Lord? The massive skull turned to look at him. What if we give you something for the cauldron? He held out one gloved hand. I would have one of your memories. I see nothing of the world beyond this realm. Tell me your story, and I will keep it with me in exchange for one use of my cauldron. Maylin clapped once and sat cross-legged on a rock near the Lord of the Damned. I have one for you. The Lord placed his hand on his chest and politely tilted his skull at her. He then cupped both hands in front of him as if she would place the memory there. Proceed. Wait. Ben approached Maylin while eyeing the Lord, afraid of provoking him with the wrong move. 
He lowered his voice. How do you know he won't take the memory away from you? Mei Lin grinned and leaned in. Don't worry. Shall we proceed? The Lord of the Damned said. She shifted her weight to make herself comfortable. Just tell the story? He nodded slowly, his bull's teeth lending him that terrible permanent grin. Ben backed up and stood near Tiago, who nervously wiped his mouth and shifted his weight. I don't know about this man. I have a daughter, Maylin said. She just had her fifth birthday before I came to Alternus. The moment Maylin began her story, black droplets appeared in the air just above the Lord's gloved hands, then fell. With each word, another drop manifested and another collecting into a pool. She loves this one type of coconut candy I only get when I travel for work. I can get her all kinds of coconut treats where we live, and I've tried buying her the healthier organic dried coconut chews I've seen a lot of parents raving about online. But it's this one specific candy she loves the most. Every time I come back from traveling, I give her at least three or four of them, but she only ever eats one and saves the rest. Once I was tidying her bedroom and found an entire stash of individually wrapped coconut sweets hidden behind her frog stuffy, like she thought the world might run out someday. I've never met another kid her age who was so oriented toward delayed gratification on her own like that. The Lord's black pool of memory had grown. Anyway, when I agreed I'd participate in... She glanced at the Lord and shifted her weight. When I decided I'd travel to Alternus, I knew I wouldn't see her for a long time. Or at least, it would feel like a long time. She caught me crying in the bathtub when I thought she was taking a nap. I told her mommy was just having a bad day. That everyone had bad days sometimes. And it helped to cry it out. She didn't say anything to me, just walked back out of the bathroom. I was so worried I'd upset her. So I hurried to get out of the bath and get dressed. Just as I finished putting my clothes on, my daughter came back into the bathroom and handed me huge fistfuls of her candy hoard. Maylin's eyes watered, but she laughed. <laughs> I know it might not seem like much to a lot of people, but the taste of coconut will always remind me of my daughter's beautiful heart. The memory pool now filled the Lord of the Dam's cupped hands. Gingerly, he brought it close to his face opened his bone jaw and tilted his hands until the dark, viscous fluid flowed down into his mouth and disappeared. Would she lose the memory? Could they do that? Ben didn't know how the VR technology worked. How powerful was this neural integration? Or was this just a roleplay quest? I am satisfied, the Lord said. You may borrow the cauldron you asked for. The pyre upon which you will place it is directly west. With the final flourish, he summoned an iron cauldron from thin air, pointed westward, then backed silently into the gloom of the cave. Gone. The three humans were quiet for a moment. Dust rose around them in the current of air that followed the Lord into his cave. Cicadas began singing again. Mei Lin hopped off the rock and clapped once. Good, let's finish this. Everything okay in there? Tiago said, bending and peering into Mei Lin's ear to mimic surveying her brain. You got all your memories? She laughed. <laughs> like I said, don't worry about it. I don't even have a daughter. Ben felt himself just barely recoil in surprise before he neutralized his expression. Had she made that up on the spot? It seemed sincere, real. He'd felt the familiar love of a parent pouring from her words. Looking at her now, she was utterly unfazed from their encounter with the Lord of the Damned and clearly comfortable lying. Or was she lying now about not having a daughter? Who was this woman? Pop the nasty flower in there. Tiago gestured to Ben with his chin and rolled up his sleeves. Unless cuddling it is like your thing. Ben scrutinized Mei Lin for a moment longer, then placed the quickening flower into the cauldron, grateful he wouldn't have to carry the gruesome-looking thing any longer. Objective one complete! 
Objective two, complete. Objective three, complete. Objective four, carry the cauldron and quickening flour to the ritual pyre. Boil the quickening flour into an elixir using the cauldron. Perform the ritual movements to activate its power. Five. The moment Ben picked up the cauldron, a 30 second timer appeared. Huh, he said, then put it down with a clang. The timer disappeared. What? Meilin said. He moved to pick it back up, but the cauldron refused to budge, as if it were anchored to the ground. One of you try to pick it up. Tiago complied, lifting the cauldron and cradling it in both arms. There's a timer. Don't put it down, Ben said. I think I'm being penalized for dropping it. Makes sense, Meilin said. We're supposed to take turns carrying it. I thought you said you didn't have the same objective last time. Oh, I didn't. It just makes sense. They seem to want to push cooperation in the afterlife. And it would be an easy exploit to just put the cauldron down when the timer ends and pick it right back up. If it were me designing the quest, I wouldn't allow players to carry it twice in a row. I'd probably put it on a 45 second cooldown or something. Who knows how long the real countdown is? Wait, what happens when the timer runs out? Tiago shifted the weight of the cauldron. I assume you can't carry it anymore. Ben thought back to one of Dante's monologues about some older game. Timed tasks that involved your character getting fatigued after a set amount of time. You probably fatigue. Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense, Tiago wobbled. Let's cover at least a little ground, Meilin said. Sorry we wasted most of your strength this round. Tiago shrugged, which made him have to adjust the cauldron again. Meilin led them in the direction the Lord had pointed. I guess our rotation will be Tiago, then me, then Ben. We'll just keep it going until we get to the pyre. I really hope it's not as far as everything else has been, Tiago said. Fortunately, it wasn't. Even with their heavy rotating burden, the trek across the rocky landscape seemed much quicker than roaming the soul-strewn plains or padding their bare feet over flesh-wrapped earth. The rough texture of the cauldron grounded Ben whenever he carried it. Wind whipped their thin clothes. Maylin was uncharacteristically quiet during this leg of the journey. Ben wondered if she was thinking about her daughter. If she even had one. After a long silence and many rounds of cauldron handoffs, Ben saw a flickering light not far in the distance. There it is. Ben picked up the pace to finish out their travels with one last burst of energy ready to get this over with and get back to his team. Maylin and Tiago kept pace. And when they arrived at the pyre, Ben removed the quickening flower before placing the cauldron over the fire. Objective task, carry the cauldron and quickening flower to the ritual pyre, complete. Where do we get water? Tiago said. As if triggered by his question, the cauldron slowly filled with water and rose to a boil with an unnatural quickness. Thank the gods for small mercies, Meilin said. Now what? Ben looked at the beating heart in his hand, wishing it were something else. Wishing the cauldron were an iron pot on a campfire in the open world of Alternus. Food may have been unnecessary, but he missed making small meals for his teammates. The meditative quality of preparing the ingredients and simmering them to perfection. Just thinking about such a peaceful thing was jarring against the backdrop of his recent experiences trudging through this landscape of blood and bone. He sighed at the dark red organ and tossed it into the water with an audible plop. Objective task, boil the quickening flour into an elixir using the cauldron complete. Now perform the ritual movements to activate its power. Beneath the text, three generic human figures appeared, each one labeled with one of the party members' names. Yes. Tiago bounced and stretched his arms. Breakdancing is my thing. We got this. Ben groaned. Really? We couldn't just make a nice soup and go home, could we? I don't know what kind of soup you eat. 
But anything with that thing in it ain't about to be nice. Come on, Ben. It'll be fun. Maylin began mirroring the movements of her labeled figure. Tiago immediately did the same, throwing personal flair into the choreography. And after a few moments of hesitation, Ben joined them. He felt incredibly silly and self-conscious. The movements reminded him of pretentious performance art. He couldn't help checking to make sure no one else was around to watch. Movements like these felt awkward. Making shapes with his hands and thrusting his arms out in front of him, throwing his head back, even making strange noises that the HUD demonstration provided. Hands fluttering out to the sides, upper body bending and curving outward, upward. One leg bent, the other out straight, leaning forward and then rising up tall. This was so annoying. A few times, Ben had to pause and shake himself out. His irritation made him stiff and the movements difficult. Maylin bounced on her feet and pretended to box him, echoing Tiago's earlier body language. Come on, you can do it. Pow, pow. You guys about ready to do the full routine? Calm down. I've got it. Just give me a minute. Tiago was a natural. It only took him a few rounds of practicing to get each movement down. He even mimicked a beat with his voice. Maylin announced herself ready as well, and Ben shrugged and decided he might as well give it a shot. All three of them swiped begin. Music swelled for the first time since he'd been dead. A strange but appealing blend of strings and deep bass drums shot through with a light sound that reminded him of rain. It made the movements make sense somehow. As they stretched their limbs and bent their bodies, it was clear this would have been impossible to complete as a solo player. Several movements required balancing against a teammate, creating shapes with one another's silhouettes, holding hands for stability. They made strange noises in unison, as directed by their HUDs, yelping and whooping and even hissing a few times, occasionally accompanied by surges in the background music. He wasn't going to say a damned word about this part of the quest to the rest of his team if he got back to the living. Hell no. When they completed the sequence of movements, all three of them held their breaths. A few seconds passed. Nothing happened. Tiago sighed. Shit. We have to... The water inside the cauldron glowed a pale pink. Motes of light floated up out of it, drifting away like fireflies. Objective one, complete. Objective two, complete. Objective three, complete. Objective four, complete. Drink the quickening elixir you have made to awaken in the living realm. They all cheered, even Ben, who hurried up to the cauldron. Wait! Maylin grabbed the back of his shirt and tugged, while at the same time pulling Tiago close by the arm. She threw her arms around both of them and wrapped them in a tight hug. I know we have to compete out there, Maylin said as she let them go. That's just the way it is. I won't expect you to give me any leeway, and I doubt I will either. But I'm glad we cooperated down here, and I want you to have a token of my appreciation. Ben said nothing, just observed her face. Was there any trace of deception? Would he be able to see it if there were? She was very good at telling stories that were just that. Stories. I keep telling my teammates we should be talking to more NPCs, she said. But they're dead set on... Well, I can't really say what they're dead set on. You understand. National security. Sort of. But I told them, if you really dig into the dialogue, sometimes you can find hidden gems, like spells. I found out about this one spell that I bet would make going after the Skull King way easier. But does the rest of China want to deviate from our plan to consider something different? No, of course not. A spell, you said? Ben kept his tone light. Tiago had his hands tucked under his armpits while he listened carefully. Yeah, it's called Ossify turns you into the undead. Well, not really. It makes you seem like the undead. You can slip right by them. Maylin swept her hand up. Whoosh! They'll think you're one of them. Now that would be useful. Maylin laughed. 
I know what you're thinking. Why would you give that away? A reasonable question, don't you think? Ben said. She waved him off. I figure if my team isn't interested, then I'd rather one of your teams get it than some other random nation. Goodness knows Korea doesn't need a rare spell, am I right? Where is it? Tiago said, then made a placating gesture. No offense, man, but once we get back out there, Brazil might want to go after it too. I'm not just gonna let the Americans have at it. Nor would I expect you to, Ben said. Malin shrugged. No idea where it is. All I know so far is that it exists, and the path to obtaining it is dangerous. I got the information from Tala and Knight's Holt, over at the blacksmith near the north end of town, but I had to do a couple of side quests to unlock the dialogue tree. Well, thank you. Ben took a few steps toward the cauldron. I appreciate it. He didn't wait to see how she responded. He just cupped his hands into the elixir and drank. Warmth filled his entire body, starting in the center of his chest and rippling outward to his head, his limbs, the soles of his feet. Pink light suffused his skin. The warmth and brightness grew until they overwhelmed him and his vision went blurry. Darkness. And then, he opened his eyes. Ben. Class, mage. Level, five. HP, one out of 67. Mana, zero out of 46. Status, weak. XP, 12,152. Next level, 15,000. You're listening to Control Alt Destroy, starring Summer Glau. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Control Alt Destroy is written by Andrea Phillips, Maurice Broadus, Jacqueline Koyanagi, and E.C. Myers. Executive produced by Molly Barton and Julian Yap. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.